Hello, and welcome to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey. Phoebe Davis is a patient who starred in a reality show called Cosmic Love on Amazon Prime. If you missed Phoebe's earlier episode on the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast, go back and check it out. It's called Patient Phoebe, Cosmic Love Star Shares Her Breast Augmentation Story. That episode was so great that we had to let her take over our podcast for a special two-part series with her surgeon, Dr. Hector Salazar, and his nurse, Carmen. Welcome to you, Phoebe. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with Dr. Salazar. It has been two months since my breast augmentation, and the reason I've taken over the podcast to talk with Dr. Salazar is to share some of the most important things I learned from my surgery and... Also, just find out how we can help others who are thinking about getting breast implants. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is just to go over like mistakes to avoid if you're considering getting a breast augmentation. Um, And I think one of the first things that it's important to do if you're considering this type of surgery is to really tune out what other people have to say, specifically on social media. Um, So basically the point is, the first thing is how important it is to not believe strangers on social media over your surgeon, because obviously you know what you're talking about. And random people online definitely don't have an idea of what they're talking about. Um, So my first question for you, Dr. Salazar, which, by the way, I'm so happy we're doing this. This is so fun. Thank you. No, thank you so Um, much, Phoebe, and thank you so much for inviting me, Monique, as well. Thank you so much for inviting me again. And I was so excited when I heard that, actually, there's going to be a takeover. And I said, like, oh, what is, who's taking over? And the Phoebe, fantastic. So, uh, no, thank you so much. I'm so, so excited. So excited about this. So I'm ready to be uh, hit with some of the the tough questions. Go ahead. Send the first one. Okay. So the first question I have is, why is it a bad idea to choose your own implant size and style based on what you read online or wanting something that your friend got? I I think that's that's a fantastic question. Um, One of the things that it's the, the most important thing is to for a patient to realize what is her goal, what's the look that she wants to obtain. Once she has that, once she can close her eyes and see that specific result, because I bet you that all patients can close their eyes and see exactly how they want to look after surgery. Once they have decided if they want to have like a big implant, small implant, if they want to look uh, augmented, they want to look more natural, if they want to have implants that ride a little higher, ride a little lower. Once they have done that mentally, it's important for them to come and obtain a consultation. Mm -hmm. It's okay and it's natural that if you're going to go and get a consultation, you have plenty of friends. Some of those friends are going to have certain opinions. Some of those friends are actually probably going to have implants, but you have to remember this. And this is something very important. Everybody is different. Every single patient has a different body. Every single patient has different amount of breast tissue that you have that you're bringing into consultation. Mm -hmm. Maybe your friend, even though you're the same height, but she has a little bit more breast tissue, or maybe she has a different shape of a breast. So when when your friend tells you like, oh, do not even let them offer you anything below 400. Don't let them do that. And you're like, it's okay. I mean, we're, 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 we're social entities. So we always want to have that nice conversation with our friend. And it's good. Take mental note out of that. Don't take it as something that is the truth and and, and the absolute truth. So only thing is, okay, good. Thanks for your advice. And But the most important thing is to come with a very open-minded to undergo that consultation and mm-hmm. to listen to the advice that your doctor is going to give you. Yeah. And that actually leads perfectly into my next question, which is how should somebody go about sizing? Because I know for for my experience during our one of two consultations, right. um, I got 
a little bit hung up. I don't know necessarily if hung up is the right word, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. I was nervous Fixated. about, okay. yeah, about like the number of, mm-hmm. of CCs itself and going up like in the number scared me, mm-hmm. but it's because I'm taller. So mm-hmm. like, like you said, it makes more sense that I would want mm-hmm. to have something that's going to fit my natural build of my body. So, um, yeah, that leads me to the sizing question. Yeah, no, I, I think, um, and I tell patients sometimes because patients, um, they get, they, it, it generates a lot of, um, um, it generates a lot of doubts when they hear from their friends or when they're, and this is not even like, this is not purchasing a dress and purchasing a dress can generate some stress, right? But so, so as many times as patients want to come before their surgery, they know, because we always tell them that the doors of our office are open. It's not, you come in and you get your implants, you leave. No, 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 it's a very important decision. So we wanna spend a good amount of time together figuring this out. And it's all based on what the goal of the patient is. And then the only reason why we're there is to facilitate that process, to give them advice. So we have several instruments, Vivi, and you actually um, experience that. Number one, and it's silly, but it's important. It sounds silly, but silly questions. Sometimes we ask questions about like a mountain with two tunnels and things that you can only walk through one of those tunnels and kind of put you to start or make you talk to make you say key words such as like, I want natural or I want an augmented look. There's no right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Another instrument is to to look at pictures. And, and, and like, if you have some pictures that you want to show me, it could be either some, some friends or pictures of patients or pictures online, or it's also another important instrument. Another step is take a good physical exam, very detailed measurements. And that's what we do. And you you underwent through that. Mm-hmm. So everything now start to come and getting clearer and clearer. Then on top of that, then we have sizers. So we basically, uh, our implants, they're simulating this ultimate size that you'll have. And then we have a t-shirt, we have a special bra that are, uh, allows us to put those sizes in and those sizers in. And then for you to look, look in the mirror, Take we take some pictures for you. You look at the pictures. Then we also have Vectra. And I think that's one of the ultimate um, devices, tools for you to make that final decision in which it's a picture of, of your body. We simulate the implants, the program, a computerized program uh, 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 help us doing that. And then you can start seeing and looking from different angles, from the top, from the bottom. By the time we are done with that first consultation, now we've narrowed it down from five different type of uh, profiles of the implants, from 40 different sizes. Now we are narrowing it down to two or three different sizes. Mm -hmm. And that's a great accomplishment. Then even after that, then you can go home, think about things, analyze things. And if you want to come back and have another visit, it's our pleasure. And and then we talk over it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that was, I mean, you answered what my next question was, which is how do you show pac- patients before they have surgery, what they might look like after? Mm-hmm. And that uh, Vectra technology was so helpful for me, especially because I was deciding between going bigger, smaller, and f- finding that natural sweet spot. Um, and that's like the coolest technology I've ever seen or even heard of um, that you guys have and you use to help patients make that decision. Oh, absolutely. That, um, I mean, that, that's, yeah, it's, it's practice changing. It, it's something that, I mean, as many tools as you can use for, the, the last thing you want or patients want is to be surprised. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they're, they're there to obtain a result that as I, we were saying, we all agree that they close their eyes and they know how they want to look. The only thing it's important to put it into words and mainly to put it into sizes. So um, yeah. <laughs> you hear this horror stories of patients that, oh, I woke up after my original breast augmentation and the doctor said that, congratulations, you got 800 cc's. And it's like, how could that happen? I mean, that 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 would be honestly i mean you 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 ask a, an architect let's build a house and then they build they come up with a building and you're like no 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 we were talking about a house so this is right. so it has to be no surprises as many things as many tools as you can get and then everybody's in the same channel you go to the operating room you deliver exactly the operation the patient was looking for boom patient is happy and our way to judge 
when a result is a good result is when we see the smile of a patient, the patient says, I like it. I like what Mm -hmm. I'm seeing. Yes, 100%. How do you think we should go about looking for a good surgeon? Um, Very, very good question. Um, I I would say it's important to start by, if you're going to undergo a breast augmentation, it's important to start by, number one, looking for a plastic surgeon, not a breast surgeon, not a cosmetic surgeon, not a general surgeon, and and God forbids, because there are cases, oromaxillofacial surgeons uh, doing breast augmentation. So Mm -hmm. it has to be a plastic surgeon, a plastic surgeon that has been board certified. So that means that his training and his level of safety has been recognized by his peers and by our body that certifies, which is the American Board of Plastic Surgery, not the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, the serious um, board and the board that is only recognized by the uh, Federation of uh, um, Boards of Medical School in the United States is the American Board of Plastic Surgery. So plastic surgeon, that has been certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Then from there, you, you, I mean, as a person that starts surfing the net and starts looking for who would be a good person, three things, I think. Number one, results. Look at the pictures. Look mm-hmm. at some of the results, of course. And also when you're looking at those results, don't think that all of the patients that you're looking through, they're gonna be you. Because as we were saying, Everybody brings different breasts. Everybody brings a different tissue, tissue quality, tissue characteristics. So not every person that you're seeing is not a, that it's going to represent your result, but at least for you to start seeing if you like the work of that person. Second mm-hmm. um, element, reviews. Now it's all about, right, I mean, you go to a restaurant, you go to a tour, you go to a, and you're looking for those reviews. So it's important that you see what are the reviews for that doctor. And so you already started with some good qualifications of the doctor, board certified plastic surgeon with good work that you can see with good reviews and also some referrals, right? I had a friend that had it done. I've heard about him. Oh, um, um, I went to a dinner and it turns out that I already had a consultation with Dr. Salazar and a couple of persons at the table. They were already talking that uh, I was going to go and see someone that he already operated on. And so I think that's a good instrument. But the most important thing is safety first. Get the mm-hmm. real deal plastic surgeon. <laughs> After yeah. that, you go and you meet him or her, and then um, you develop a relationship, right? Once you have knocked down all those different stages and all those different hurdles that the, the doctor doesn't even know that the doctor's already jumping to become your, your surgeon, now you start your interaction. Did he spend a good amount of time with me? D- do I feel that I can trust him? I mean, if everything mm-hmm. gl- goes well, Fantastic. If there's a little problem, if there's a little bumpy road, am I going to feel fine uh, with him and with him taking care of me? Do I get that feeling that we can work together? And and that's it. Yeah. Wow. That's such good advice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Changing gears a little bit. So back okay. to the whole social media thing. Mm-hmm. So after we shared that one video that we posted um, talking about, I think it was like the videos of our first consultations. um, Mm -hmm. And it was a little clip of my interview when I was on the podcast. Um, I got some like, you know, fairly spicy comments from people on there. Most people were like, wow, you look great. Like, so proud of you. Thank you for being Mm -hmm. authentic and open about your journey. Correct. And then, of course, there were a couple trolls, as always, with social media. And Mm -hmm. I have gotten, you know, a few people who have messaged me saying like, wow, you you ruined your body. You were so natural and beautiful before. And and I just like laugh it off because I'm like, first of all, you have no idea who I am. (laughs) And I didn't do it for you, sweetie. (laughs) Um, so in that process, it just, it made it so clear that I wasn't doing this for anyone other than for myself. Um, so can you tell when a patient is maybe approaching surgery and and undertaking this journey for someone other than themselves? Um, and if you can like spot that and how do you handle that? 
Wow. Um, yeah, spicy question, as you're saying. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So um, I, I, I agree with everything that you've said before, right? I mean, um, everything we do in life, uh, people tend to tend to judge it and people tend to have their own opinion about about that. So it's a practically impossible to keep. And I, I know that you uh, uh, have a, a good number of, of followers in social media. So you're always going to get a good combination of the general public out there following you. And there's going to be, as you're saying, some people that are going to be trolling and some people that, that you can never make them happy. Mm -hmm. That's really important. The most important thing is nobody else is going to undergo the breast augmentation but you. Not right. even not even your parents, not even your sisters and brothers and your kids and your husband or your you are the most important person th throughout that journey. That being said, I think it's also important that the people that are around you and your very very close inner circle, they're connected and they're and they support what you're doing. But the most important uh, thing is that you want to have it done for you, for yourself. Um, when we find that patients have unrealistic expectations or they think they're, I don't know, like let's say their success in their career fully depends on the presence or absence of implants or the presence or absence of this, like, um, I don't know, liposuction or change on their chin or um, then that, that, that would be the, the wrong reason. When, you, when we feel that patients, I mean, imagine as you're saying, a patient walks in and, and then whoever is with her, uh, he or she are telling her what implants she needs to have and what she needs to do or what surgery she needs to undergo. And I mean, that, that's a clear red flag, as you're yeah. saying, that, that that patient shouldn't undergo that surgery. We're all adults. We all have to give our consent, an educated consent. If mm -hmm. we detect that something like that is happening, definitely I want to see two or three times that patient before we commit to any surgery and, mm -hmm. and try to try. I mean, we, uh, as you experienced it, we, we spend a good amount of time together. It's not a, like a 10 minute, the doctor walks in and then comes in like a maestro and throws some fairy dust and then leaves the room. And, <laughs> and no, no, we, we become, we, we develop a nice relationship in, in, in our uh, consultation room and we get to feel the patient and we get, I mean, they get to know us, we get to know them. And then you can start seeing those signs or those signals of mm, careful here because probably she's not, she doesn't even want the surgery or she's not looking the surgery for the right reason. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's something, it's our mission. I mean, um, to it, it's our mission to actually clarify that for the patient or explain to her exactly what the surgery is about and what is she looking for, and then try to uh, have a very good outcome. And if if she's not a candidate for surgery, or if, uh, then we shouldn't operate. Mm -hmm. Have you ever turned a patient away from like feeling like okay, maybe this isn't a good fit type of thing? Correct. Um, no, yes, yes. The answer to that is yes. And and if you see and look at it from um, from let's say a business standpoint, so so what we have is a business, right? I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it, it's um, it's it's a place where we we perform surgery, safe surgeries for patients. If a patient comes in asking for a surgery, the most ideal situation is that she's looking for a realistic result that we can provide for her that result. Boom, fantastic! It will work. But the, our main goal, we're doctors. There's a say, primum no nocere, right? First, do no harm. So, mm -hmm. so first of all, we're doctors, then we're surgeons, then we're plastic surgeons, uh, and we're human beings. So, so right. our, our main goal is not to let's try to operate on every single person in, in, in the county of San Diego and, and beyond its limits. Uh, it's, it's, in reality, is to if someone has or has detected a certain body part that they want to improve and the expectation is realistic and that's why it's important to spend time together mm -hmm. and we can provide that let's do it if not i'll rather stay as a like develop that doctor patient relationship but probably for me it's better to give you advice and say um no we cannot broaden your shoulders 
we, <laughs> for, you know, like some like, or, or people like, oh, no, I'm sorry, we cannot make you taller. So, right. Right. Or, or, or um, put in uh, 900 cc implants in me and I'm like, a, not even an A cup. And so, so we, we have to, and, and it's a much better and healthier, develops a healthier relationship with that patient if you're honest and you guide them than if you just like, say like, oh, sure, we can do it. Because technically you can do many things, but you have to be able to do the right thing for each patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, answer, long answer to say, yes, we have told people like, well, I, I, what you're asking for, at least in my hands, we, we can't deliver it. Or we don't think that uh, your body characteristics can actually lead you in that direction. Um, and we always encourage to get a second, a third, or a fourth opinion, and we would never, ever, ever be offended. The more informed our patients are, the better it is. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I felt I that's part of the reason why I think we developed such a great relationship working together because mm -hmm. I could tell immediately that it was like you, your best interest is in the patient and like oh. providing those results. And I could just sense that from the very beginning. Um, you had mentioned... Um, about like surrounding yourself with a community of people who are going to support you and support that you're making this decision for yourself, not because of them or, you know, career, whatever it might be. Um, and I brought my sister with me to my second consultation. Remember? Because, um, yes, because I didn't want to go through the process alone. I was scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think this, like, like this journey of getting your getting a breast augmentation, it's a big choice and it can right. be super scary to go through alone. And I think that can be a mistake to just like not have that support system around you. Mm -hmm. um, do you think people know ahead of time that they can bring a friend or a family member along with them to the consultation? So we, we always, when you uh, touch base with our coordinators, then of course, if you will have someone that want, you want to bring, I mean, imagine, let's bring it down again to what we were talking about, about purchasing a dress. Isn't that mm -hmm. like, I mean, you're purchasing a dress for yourself, for your, for, to, for you to wear it. But the classic thing is you invite a couple of friends or you invite your best friend or get your boyfriend or, 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 or girlfriend or, or, or someone involved to go with you because you want to share that decision. You want to see like, oh, I want to hear your opinion. And that's important. That's how humans are. So uh -huh. imagine to get a breast augmentation, if you want to bring a friend, if you want to bring your sister, if you want to bring your mother, if you want to bring your husband, if you want to bring your partner, whoever you want to bring, I think it's really important. And if you ask me, if you say in the ideal world, doc, uh, when is the right time for me to bring that person? Right off the bat, right from the first uh, visit, it's really important to bring that person with you. Um, if you have, so let's say that you want to undergo breast augmentation and then that significant person does not want you to have a, a breast uh, augmentation, should you still bring that person? Well, I, I would say that first, it's something that, that you have to work with that person. It doesn't matter if it's a friend or a family or, or a partner or something to, to try to for them to be at least in the same boat that it, you might benefit from that surgery. And if they want to be better informed, it's a great it's a great um, uh, environment for them to to learn more about it. If they can write down some questions as well that maybe you're not going to be able to think about or you have mm -hmm. thought, then it's also important to bring them. And and believe me, I mean, we like our patients to be informed. We would never be offended by any question. Uh, we want to make um, people feel so comfortable they can ask. Oh, and what about this? Or what about this myth? Or is this a myth or not? Um, my God, um, is she going to poison her body with this implants? Or <laughs> right? I mean, and I think it's that, that we like to hear those questions because that's our opportunity not only to educate our patient but also to educate the general public. So, totally. um, so yeah, get them involved, bring them in, and right off the bat, first visit, uh, we I mean, you want to bring two friends? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it worked out great for me because my sister lives out of town and she happened to be in town when I had my second consultation. Um, and that she's was also, very happy. yeah. I was and, very and happy she, when I met her. Yeah. 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 And that, that just like solidified everything. Cause she's also a nurse for a plastic surgery center in Scottsdale. So, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was fantastic. And actually. And she people, asked all those questions that I, I couldn't think questions. of. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it's, it's funny. The fact that sometimes. Um, 
sometimes for, let, let's say that, um, so let's say she's a nurse and then it, it, she, she's there in the room and she says, or she, sometimes I feel that they feel like a little intimidated to say, oh, um, by the way, I'm a nurse and I work with another plastic surgeon, right? But when we hear that, it's fantastic because it's like perfect. Now we can elevate even uh, to like the level of questions to a whole now a whole new um, experience, and the only one who's going to be benefit from that it's the patient. So, so um, it was fantastic. I mean, we have even on her visit not only was infor- informative, but we even have fun. And and because mm-hmm. she knew some of the oh yeah um, think about this after surgery uh, consider that and then you were like she questioned you a little bit more even and we we were all at the end we reached that perfect final implant that that we were able to place and 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 that we we're happy about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know I, that was that was. I mean, obviously that was the pivotal moment <laughs> in the in the decision making <laughs> process, <laughs> but. Yeah, it was so helpful to have her there because, like you said, she's in that industry. She knows how to answer those questions, and I was just like, I don't know. So, so, so let me let me ask you a question that I, I've never I, I, I never ask you. Um, when when after that visit and you girls left, uh, what were her impressions? Did she say like, oh, I, I think this is a good place for you to have your augmentation, or oh, I, I what 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 were the impressions uh, with her? <laughs> yeah, no, she was like, Doctor Salazar is legit. Oh. Like, I think, I think you should definitely move forward. Like, I, I think you're really going to like how it's going to end up. And her biggest can not concern, but it was just like, just be in mind, like it's going to change how you see your body post-surgery. Right. And like, we both know I'm in fitness and, and taking mm-hmm. that time off to recover was <clears throat> a huge sacrifice for me, but totally worth it. So. Fantastic. Good to hear. Mm-hmm. Um. So what does it tell you as the surgeon if somebody wants to have a second consultation? What kind of message does that say? Uh, I, honestly, I'm, I'm happy. When I hear she's coming back again, I, that, that, that means that we're going to talk more, that there's going to be more information. Um, sometimes, I mean, there's they're different nature of the reason. Sometimes is she th- she had a second thought or she talked to a friend or she floated the idea here or there. Um, and um, so the only thing is, of course, before I walk into the room, I thoroughly read my previous note and um, and then we're we it's it's fantastic because we're not starting from scratch. Now we're starting from a a, a good level of knowledge, both the patient and the doctor. We know what they want, they know what we can deliver. And now it's only about fine tuning and sometimes they what about if you add a little bit of this or what if I, what do we talk about this other body part? And but it makes it so so nice. It's a, it's it, it's a good experience to have that second visit. Um I, I would say the great majority of patients don't have that uh, second visit, but the ones that have it, it's a fantastic experience. Sometimes also could be to share a second opinion. Oh, I went mm-hmm. here and they told me this, this, and that. Why are you taking a different approach? Or why wouldn't you recommend that? It, it's fabulous because it gives you the opportunity to even clarify more. Because imagine you come in for for a consultation and let's say that it's about a certain body part and then there's like 30, 40 different moves and surgical techniques that you can have. It's practically impossible to go over all those different ones. But if they hear about one of those and they want to clarify like, oh, why are you not adding this? Or why did you choose this over that one? Perfect. I mean, it's it, it's great. I mean, I love second consults. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so... Obviously, I never experienced this with you, but as someone going into a consultation and like if they feel pressured by their surgeon, hmm. what should they do in that situation? And good to hear that you didn't feel that because that should be the last thing. Again, we're 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 not a um, we're not a car dealership or right. Now. <laughs> I mean, it's not that you. You want to go and check out a car, but then you're like, oh, man, I'm going to sit down there and I'm going to be pressured and they're going to be pushing and uh, it's better not even to go. Right. So, uh, no. So I I feel that, number one, it's about and I tell patients when we're in the room. So, you know, our nurse Carmen, the coordinators, you, uh, your family member. and, and, And and I 
I, I make the point that you're the most important person in the room. It, it sounds like trivial, but it is true. I mean, it's not about me. It's not about other people. It's not about whatever surgery, whatever 20 surgeries I could perform in you. It, it, it's about what you want and how we can reach that result in the quickest, safest way possible. So mm -hmm. um, if a patient feels pressured in during their visit in a plastic surgery uh, practice, I would say what they should do is listen to what they have to say, get a second or a third opinion. It's probably they're going to be with a little bit of a bitter flavor going into that second or third because they're going to say, mm, now I'm going to have to hear about like all these like 30 other body parts that I could improve. And, and, and in reality, mm -hmm. if it doesn't bother the patient, it should never bother the doctor. And mm -hmm. th there, there are very little things that, uh, I, it, according to my philosophy, there are very little things that could be suggested while you're doing a certain procedure, but very, very few. I could actually count them with, um, um, I could, there are very few. Uh, because, <laughs> because, because the thing is, Again, it's not about the doctor, it's not about the surgery practice, it's not about how much money the practice can make during a, one surgery, it's about what the patient wants. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would yeah. say uh, go and visit, set up another consultation with someone else and see what they have to say. And if they wanna come and see us, that'll be amazing. <laughs> yes, and they should come and see you, absolutely. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> how do you help people who are nervous or worried about getting there, like they, they come to the appointment, basically me. How did there you, you deal with me? <laughs> yeah. You're protecting, you're protecting. I know, I know, I know. But how do you deal with people who are nervous or worried about, about getting this done, but they are obviously coming to you for a purpose, like they want it to get done, but they're scared? Yeah, once once the patient is sitting in, in, in one of our exam rooms, for sure they want to have it done, right? It's what, whichever body part we're talking about, it bothers them or wants, they want to have an improvement so much that they have already thought about it, done their research, uh, talked to friends, talked to the coordinators, set up the appointment, um, they've filled out some forms. So, so that says a lot. And, and there's a lot of, there's a big effort from the patient's side. So, so they're truly interested. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is for them during that first consultation to get this feeling. We do this all the time. I mean, it, and, and that feeling, you don't get it by me saying or telling you, hey, we do this all the time. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're gonna, right? I mean, you're gonna get that flavor as you go through the consultation, as we go through pictures, as we go through diagrams. So as your, as your sister was saying, okay, this guy is legit. He knows what he's talking about. At the same time, that we are professional and then and that we take it, we take our, our job very, very seriously, mm -hmm. that they see the human in the doctor so that they can feel that they, they mi casa is su casa, right? I mean, that you mm -hmm. get to our office and then you feel, man, I'm. I'm at home. I mean, these guys are making me feel so comfortable. All right. Mm -hmm. So not only he is capable, but he makes me feel comfortable. And in addition to that, uh, and this I do say it because sometimes patients, um, uh, it's hard to for patients to understand the different certifications and all that. So, so because they're very complex. So what I tell them, I talk to them about if they're going to have general anesthesia, that the anesthesiologist is a certified. MD anesthesiologist, the real mm -hmm. deal anesthesiologist that they would get at the hospital if they're having a, I don't know, like gallbladder surgery or some like big surgery, like, um, I don't know, something cardiac or, or something big, that they're going to have that same level of care for their anesthesia. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing as well for us to emphasize a lot is, and that immediately starts bringing the level of stress down, the fact that our operating room is quad A certified. And what in the world that means? It's basically the same level of certifications th that the outpatient surgery centers for the largest hospitals in town have. So we have that same level of certification. So mm -hmm. it starts by, he knows what he's doing, continues into, and he makes me feel comfortable into, okay, and where I'm going to have my surgery is not like 
a room in an office where they like, oh, bring this, like, let's start doing your surgery. And then by the end, it's like, okay, now my level of stress is down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. Do people ever do anything after their procedure to screw up their results? Like (laughs) lifting too heavy? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Could it be me? (laughs) Mm. But 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 you know what and and I mean and you are a fantastic patient you follow I all did our so instructions good. and everything you've behaved so well uh, I think uh, uh, communication is important and very very important um, and th- I mean the post operative period even though people go like oh my god okay that the toughest part is already done we underwent surgery and I'm ready to go Mm-mm. those two three weeks after the procedure are key in every sense to not to get into any complication, not to run into a problem, not to, I mean, continue molding those results, even things that we recommend. I mean, something even down to the silliest point when we say don't shower tomorrow, but sh- but you can shower the following day. That recommendation comes from pure science. It's not that we just like came up with like a magical, like, oh, 24 hours for showering. Every single thing that we tell them, every like when I was saying for the next three weeks, we're not going to be lifting any anything heavier than a gallon of milk. When all those recommendations are very important. And we infuse that culture in our patients. We 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 share with them that it's so important that that it's critical that they follow them up. You can run into problems. You can start bleeding. You can um, you can ruin, a, 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 in a way, or temporary a result if you don't follow those instructions. So we, mm-hmm. we hold their hand and we tell them what to do at what point, um, w- how to start taking care of their scar, how to, all that. We guide them through that process. And also they're going to be influenced as well by uh, friends and family that they were not involved uh, during the procedure. So they're also going to be getting a different type of uh, advice like, oh my God, don't, um, in my surgery, I was only down for one week and they let me start exercising. And mm-hmm. no, but my, my doctor said specifically three weeks before I start like doing some heavy weight lifting. So yeah, you, you, you can, patients can do it. You behave really well. And, and I would say in general, I would, all of our patients, we infuse that culture of like, it's critical. So they, they follow the instructions <laughs> quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I, I mean, I experienced that too. I had a few friends who were like, wow, you're still not at the gym yet. And I'm like, mm-hmm. And you feel no. bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're like, well, I was, in, I was in the gym like two weeks after my surgery. And I'm like, well, good for you, but I'm not going because my doctor said I can't. <laughs> right. No, you don't want to hear the story of, uh, oh, I went grocery shopping. I was like two weeks out and, and then I started bleeding. And you're like, and why? Well, I was carrying like a little grill that I found and I wanted to buy it. And so, so yeah, you don't, you don't, I mean, there's all these different, different moments in which you just got to be careful after surgery. And then after three weeks, and it depends on the surgeries, right? But for, for instance, for breast augmentation, after three weeks, you're going to be ramping it up and you're going to be moving at a nice steady pace. And you know that everything's fine and you're not going to ruin anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then that, that period of three weeks, it's an investment. Then you're like, okay, now I'm back to the gym and keep on moving forward. Yeah. Something that I really, really appreciated from both you and from Carmen Mm -hmm. during my post-op experience was just the follow-up from you guys. Like, Carmen would call and, like, leave me voicemails, checking in on me. Like, if you need anything, how's recovery going? Like, are you taking your meds? (laughs) Right, right. It was like, that's why I feel such a close relationship with both of you is because I, I truly feel like we developed such a strong, like, like I felt like you guys were family through this mm-hmm. whole process. And I feel like that's what a patient should look for in their surgeon and the nurses that work with them because you want to just feel at home with these people. And and I definitely, definitely did with my experience with you guys. I'm so happy to hear because um, we develop a nice relationship with our patients. And and I think, because um, I've, I've, I've heard it, I mean, patients sometimes when I tell them, okay, and, and um, so we're going to see you tomorrow, or we're going to see you next week, and or we're going to see you the following week. And they go like, oh, really? This is not the last time? And you're like, at the first post-operative visit and you're like, <laughs> like, oh, wow. And, and, and no, of course not. We're still going to see you at, at a week, at, at, at 
two weeks, at three weeks, at a month, at six months, at a year. And we're going to end as many times as you need to come. And it's like, oh, wow, that's so nice because I've heard of friends that they only saw the surgeon the day of surgery and they never saw the surgeon again. Or, uh, oh, no, to get a hold of the nurse, it was practically impossible. And we're like, oh, my God. And there's like, that's not a, that doesn't show a very close commitment to to the patient. And as I was saying, it's important to obtain a good result that you're Keep on watching your patient. Keep on keep on making small corrections. If there's a need to advise in terms of activity, in terms of a cream, in terms of a little injection, in terms of all these different va- variables that, that the only thing that they're going to do is carry you to a, a very nice experience and a great result. If you don't see the patient, you're never going to catch on anything. So mm-hmm. um, uh, it, it's, it's something that, that we like to make it feel like that. Carmen is... Um, she's always, yeah, as you're saying, on top of things, she's uh, calling you and asking you, do you need anything? And, and uh, sometimes you need that phone call because you think that, that you, could, you could think or what, what, what patients were uh, that, that I was just mentioning can think about that. They're like, oh, those are closed. Uh, I, I can't talk to them. Oh, no. And patients get that feeling right uh, from the beginning of our uh, consultations that they can trust us and that they can, if there's any concern, doors are always open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've always, always appreciated that about you guys for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Final question. Okay. Are there, a- are there any questions that you want patients to think of and have come prepared when they come to their consultation? Okay. So, um, Yeah. I would say that it's important for patients to to ask or and, and have your questions prepared always. Uh, create a list. You, you never know what's going to be during the consultation, the environment that that it's going to start developing. Meaning, I and you you're a witness with us. You reach a point. Do you have any questions? And if you wouldn't have those questions right away. We can wait and we can mm-hmm. let you think and we can let you check your list, whatever you want to do. The, the, when a patient's going to an, someone else, maybe she's not going to feel that way. Maybe she's going to say like, oh, my God, uh, I don't have my questions ready and the doctor already left. So always have those questions written down. The more you can talk with friends, as you're saying, and 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 listen from their experiences, keep your mind open that not what happened to every single one of them or what the recommendations they got is what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. But but it's good to hear from them and, uh, and and write those questions down. What about this size? What about the shape of implant? What about um, this technique or this incision site for you when, when you can put in the implant in? And so have those questions written. The second thing is always, always ask questions about other options. What are the alternatives to what I'm getting done? And it's also mm. very important. The third one would be to always dig in a little bit more into the recovery part, because I think that's key. And depending on what what you do, but it's also very important that you get a feeling so you can choose the right moment to have your surgery, mm-hmm. um, not two weeks before your wedding or, or stuff like that. But thinking that, oh, my God, yeah, my friend said that she, she recovered after one week, so my, I'm going to go to my destination wedding the next the next week. So, mm-hmm. so, so that that's also important. And and lastly, I would say, never be afraid to ask your surgeon about his or her qualifications. Their mm-hmm. uh, their training, their background. Don't feel bad because if they are real plastic surgeons. Um, they're going to be proud and happy to share that with you rather than mm-hmm. if you ask me like, oh, Dr. Salazar, are, are you, last question, are you a board-certified plastic surgeon? I'm going to be very happy to tell you everything about it and to tell you what does that imply. I would never mm-hmm. be like, oh, you're uh, doubting about my capacity, yeah. <laughs> right? right? So, but maybe someone who's not, they're going to be defensive about it. Right, um, one, right. One, it, it, it's funny because one question that it's key for patients that they're not sure if their surgeon is the real deal. The one and only question would be, um, for instance, we're going to do a breast augmentation, right? So you would ask the surgeon, Dr. Salazar, you're telling me we're going to do a breast augmentation. If I would ask you to do this breast augmentation that you're going to do in your surgery center, do you have privileges at a hospital to do this surgery, meaning could you do my surgery 
at a hospital? Are you privileged by Scripps, by Sharp, by Kaiser, by to get that surgery done at that hospital? And that question differentiates a oral maxillofacial surgeon placing implants because that person would never, ever be privileged at a hospital where things are very much regulated Mm -hmm. to be able to put breast implants in. And Mm. and believe it or not, that happens. So so that question is, can you do my tummy tuck? Do you have privileges to do it at the hospital? If that doctor is a OBGYN doing tummy tucks, that doctor would never have privileges at a hospital to do a tummy tuck because that's out of the area of his expertise. Mm -hmm. So I think if there's one question to ask at the end of any consultation, say, doc, what you're going to do, the surgery that you're planning, can you execute that surgery at a hospital if if we would need to? Are you privileged Mm -hmm. at a hospital? And then if you still have your doubts, if you ask me, can you give me a letter stating that? I would, and I'll be very happy to do it because I can. Yeah. So I think that, I don't know, that, that's like my my um, little key question at the end uh, during a consult. And uh, the real ducks, they would not have a problem. I would say like, oh, of course. Yes, I do. Yeah, I would have, I mean, clearly I didn't ask that right. question. No, but, no. <laughs> but, but I feel like that's so helpful for mm-hmm. people on, on the hunt for the, mm-hmm. the right surgeon to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, because I would have never thought to ask that question, but that's so true. And I think you can definitely sense when you ask a doctor a question um, about like about their credentials and when they they react in a more defensive manner than like, yeah, of course, like I'd love to share my experience with you and and come from a place of like confidence so that you can feel confident about the person you're working with. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yeah. Um, okay, where can we follow you on Instagram, Dr. Salazar? Tell, let the people know. All right, I'm Hector Salazar, MD, on Instagram. Um, then also at the uh, La Jolla Cosmetic account, which um, we uh, we have, and uh, definitely is something that um, follow us so you can um, get a little bit of the flavor of what we do, uh, get a little bit of the vibe, and um, and the best way to. Uh, get to know us, of course, is during a consultation. Uh, this, um, I mean, podcasts are fantastic. You can also check our podcast that we've done in the past. And uh, that also gives you, um, uh, and it, it creates, um, you'll see the environment that we work in. You will see what's our philosophy. And um, and then when you come in for a consultation, you're going to feel that you already know us. And then it's mm-hmm. going gonna, it's gonna to create a, a great, great atmosphere. Yeah. Well, Dr. Salazar, thank you so much for letting me do this podcast takeover and interview you today. It's been such a pleasure as always, and I will see you in my uh, my post op appointment in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna see each other in person soon. So, uh, no, thanks so much for the invitation. That takeover was fantastic, and um, and. Uh, Thank you so much for being such a great and nice patient, behaving so well. And I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you are very excited about your results and we are celebrating together with you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetic. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego freeway in the Zymed building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.